It is my privilege to hand the gavel to the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Thank you very much. Trump's not a conservative, he's an authoritarian narcissist. So I think they basically called him out for that. He's a populist authoritarian narcissist, and he doesn't think in, Ill, in, in classical liberal conservative terms. He thinks in, in an authoritarian way, and he's been able to get a, a, a big chunk of the Republican base to follow him because, you know, he's the culture warrior. With the proud, hardworking patriots who made this country run and made the country great. Might not be so great right now, but we're going to have it great very quickly again. I, I was not an ever Trumper. I governed with them, and I'm very proud of those days. I'm proud of the accomplishments of the tax reform, the deregulation of criminal justice reform. I'm really excited about the judges we got on the bench, not just the Supreme Court, but throughout the judiciary. But I am a never again Trumper. Why? Because I want to win. And we lose with Trump. Hello, and welcome to the Washington Post Live and our election 2024 series. I'm Paul Kane senior congressional correspondent and columnist here at The Post. Today, we are talking with former House Speaker Paul Ryan. Welcome to election 2024. And of course, there is the Green Bay Packers helmet in the backdrop. Let me Some things sure never change. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me, let, me, let me get you to explain to our audience what it what it is you do now you're a, a lot of former house speakers your good friend john boehner um you know set up corner offices and law firms or lobbying firms in in washington dc uh, they do a lot of familiar work around town um you've kind of done things a little bit different you're more in the new york financial scene um and you haven't been a big presence in the in the washington uh, in the Washington scene. Explain to me what it is you actually do every day. Well, first of all, PK, good to see you again. Um, I have beard envy. That last clip you had was my bow hunting beard, which is like a yeah. two month thing. So you're way, you're, you're, you're better than I am on the beard front. Um, so what do I, is that I do? Yeah, I didn't, I decided not to, to, to earn my living in Washington. Um, I wanted to do it Otherwise, I retired after 20 years in Congress at age of 48. So I still, like I said, I have a lot of gas in the tank. And I wanted to uh, choose a few new professions. Um, my my the only thing I do in D.C. is I'm a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. That's a think sure. tank in D.C. And I'm on the board of a, a foreign policy think tank called CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So I do think tank work in mm -hmm. D.C. In Wisconsin, I launched a poverty foundation that I run, which focuses on evidence based policy solutions for poverty. And then I'm, a, I'm an economics professor at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm on the board of their poverty center there. So I work with Notre Dame economists and at my foundation on measuring what we think are very promising poverty programs to run randomized control trials on them to be able to scale and replicate them and then inform policymakers. So I spend a bit of my policy time on poverty economics um, and macroeconomics uh, at, at AEI. Um, but I'm also a partner at a private equity firm, a middle market private equity firm called Solomir Capital, where we invest in founder owned businesses uh, to grow those businesses. Um, and then I'm, a, I'm vice chairman of Taneo, a, a global CEO advisory uh, firm, and I'm on a handful of boards of directors. And so what I wanted to do was scale a couple learning curves in the field of economics, small business growth founder economics. Um, that's Solomir and then and Taneo, very large cap, um, big business problems. I like problem solving. I like economics. So I spend my private sector stuff in that area. And then on my vocational portfolio, poverty, economics, and a few think tank jobs. And I, and I just adore teaching. Notre Dame is a great place to teach. 
So I like doing that. So I basically decided to build a sort of a portfolio of things that, 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 that appeal to my interests. And the greatest thing about it is I run my own schedule. I never got to do that before. So I'd be able, I'm able to run my schedule and wrap it around um, my family commitments. I retired when my kids were in high school. They're now on college, on college. Um, but that's basically what I do now. So I, I don't do a lot of DC stuff. And I didn't want to become just a political pundit. I didn't, it didn't really interest me, frankly. I wanted to go do other things with my life. Okay. Well, listen, I want to start with a topic that was something that came up a lot in your uh, couple of years as House Speaker. It's, it's Russia. Uh, just yesterday, there was uh, a new court filing from federal prosecutors that say that this person who has been an FBI informant who a lot of the top House Republican investigators at Judiciary and Oversight Committees have been relying on, um, that his, his lies that they are accusing him of in terms of information that he gave to the FBI about Hunter Biden and that whole business scheme involving Ukraine and Burisma, that it was probably from Russia, that this is uh, information that was coming through Russia to him, to the FBI. Um, what is it about Russia in which we continue to come back to this sort of reverb loop that started back in 2016, where they they keep trying apparently, and to some measures they, they sort of keep succeeding? Yeah, I can't speak to this particular intelligence because that happened after I was gone. Don't even know who this person is. I obviously, I, I saw the press yesterday and I'm familiar with um, you know, the House investigators and what they claim. Um, but Russia has been trying to penetrate our system for a long, before 2016. I mean, for, for quite a long time, they got very active in those days. And obviously now, as we know, that Russia tried to, to affect our elections. Um, on the flip side of this, what makes Republicans angry, deservedly so in this particular case, is that the Obama Justice Department did abuse the FISA court. They did abuse the FISA laws on this matter. Um, and, you know, the, we can go into the steel dossier and all that stuff. Only point is Russia is meddling in our politics. They clearly are trying to penetrate our system. They're trying to affect our elections. They've got bots on, on Twitter, which we call X now, and all the rest of it. They are an adversary. They're trying to use our democracy against us. Um, I see this as part of a larger picture where you have our adversaries, which are these tyrants. Xi in China, Putin in Russia, non-democratic tyrannies trying to use technology and our openness of, of a free society of democracies against us to try and defeat us in the 21st century for primacy. They believe our weakness is our freedom so that we would polarize ourselves into inaction. And they make the case that with technology, they can make faster, leaner, meaner decisions. I, I, I bet against that. I think we, democracy will beat tyranny in the 21st century, but we sure have our work cut out for us. And Russia is basically with a bayonet trying to try to poke and find the soft tissue in the American political system. And this is probably just one more chapter in that story. Do you think that they found that uh, that little hole in the system with Tucker Carlson? Well, what did you think if you saw any of the clips of him rolling through uh, Soviet, sorry, Russian uh, grocery stores proclaiming their greatness. I, that was just astounding to me. I just, you know, that one takes the cake, frankly. Um, yeah, I mean, what they're going to try and do is build sympathy. What, what worries me more, and not just Tucker, but that's a symptom of all this, is that they're curating sympathy in America. And, and they're, they're helping nurture and develop an isolationist wing in my party and in our country, which I think is very, very dangerous. They're developing, you know, people who want to see NATO reduced or NATO not adhered to. Um, obviously, President, former President Trump is pushing this line as well. So what I very much worry about is they're, they're, they're helping curate a line of thought, a school of thought that is isolationist, that is pro-Putin, pro-Russia, pro-tyranny at the end of the day. And that is extremely dangerous for, for, for all democracy, but for us as ourselves, democracy. And so what I see Tucker as just one little chapter in that story. Um, I didn't watch that whole interview. I watched a little bit of it, but it just looked like a kind of an infomercial for Putin to be able to push his propaganda. You're, you're still on the board of Fox, correct? Yes. And do, you, do you feel as if Fox could do a better job 
of promoting some of the values that you are talking about. Well, uh, we, we do quite a bit. I mean, obviously, as you know, Tucker no longer works at Fox and he was, he was let go. I won't go into all the details of that other than what, what, what Fox, they have, there's opinion and then there's news and news reports all of these aspects. And there are people with opinions that give their opinions. And look, I am in the minority of my party right now. I'm not in the establishment. I'm frankly an anti-establishment Republican. And you, I think you can safely argue, I don't enjoy acknowledging this, that Trump is the establishment and Trump populism is the establishment. And that Trump populism is this more isolationist strain that I think is wrong and dangerous and I, and I don't support, but that does represent um, a large swath of Republican voters. And so you will see opinions um, representing that majority, that establishment, um, um, that, that current present day establishment. So at the start of this election cycle, you still seem to have some hope that Trump would not be the nominee. I think the quote I have here is, I think the Republican are you voters- me earlier or are you dating me, are you saying right now? <laughs> no, I, early in the election cycle, you seem to think that, it, that he was not, that he could be beaten, that there were a lot of conservatives out there. Um, I think at one point your, your line was, with Trump, we lose. So yeah. what happened? Why was he able to hold on and, and do away with this field faster than just about anybody would have expected? Um, and, you know, is it that the voters have changed? And they're they're no longer you know looking for that type of Paul Ryan Mitt Romney George W Bush vision. Uh, I think it's a bunch of things. I think it's it partly what you said. Uh, they want a fighter. They want a scrapper. They want a cultural warrior. Um, I I also think these indictments, particularly the New York ones, um, made him a victim, and that grafted MAGA onto him that much more. Um, look. I, I think these federal indictments are far more serious. I think these New York ones are far more political in nature. If his name was Don Smith, I'm, I wasn't, I'm not sure that they, he would have been indicted. You know, I, I don't doubt that he cooked the books and paid off the porn star, but I'm, I'm a little, I don't think he would probably have gotten indicted for these things if he was just some other citizen. My point being is these indictments made him a victim. It gave him a very credible victim narrative and that, that more grafted MAGA onto him. Um, people want to see a fighter. Yes, he was able to dispatch, and he sucks the oxygen out of the room with news. He can dominate news cycles. And that made it really hard for a lot of these primary opponents to really to catch fire. And you could argue we had too many, uh, we had a big field that was too big for too long. Nikki's still hanging around the hoop, and you know I'm glad she's there. But I also think that our, our party has changed. Um, we have a, a party that is really dominated by Trump populism. And that is um, culture war populism. It's zero sum game politics. So it, we don't. Ha it's not a. Cons it's not conservatism as I would describe it. Classical liberal conservatism, where a party is based on principles and policies that achieve goals and ends that are timeless. And then th that that can have a lot of people that could become the champion um, of those principles. It's really a party dominated by the cult of personality of Trump. The zero sum game politics that gets played off of that. The fact that he has been, you know, victimized more or less. And so that I think has made it harder for the, the let's just say at the 40% base to leave him. And that in ease, so he was going into this primary with a very good sticky base. The reason I, used, I always made the electability argument is we do lose with him. He only won 2016. That's the only election he's ever won. And then we lost the House. We lost the Senate. We lost the Senate in the House again. And, and I still think that's, that's probably the better likelihood. But the, the other part of this, and I'll, I'll give you a quick answer, is Biden is so weak. That's a problem for, for this. For, for those of us to say we lose with Trump, it's a harder argument to make these days because of Biden's in, inherent weakness. And so even Trump is beating tr Biden in the polls these days. And I think that's more of a testament to how weak Biden is than how strong Trump is. Look at the Marquette poll in Wisconsin. Nikki Haley beats Biden by double digits in Wisconsin and in other states. Trump beats Biden by one point. So I still think there's a big delta, a difference between pick your Republican not named Trump. Let's just go with Nikki Haley. She destroys Biden, wins the House, wins the Senate in a general election. With Trump, because of Biden being so weak, he st he's still barely edges out Biden in the polls. Um, makes it a close election. I think at the end of the day, Democrats come home. 
not because they're motivated by Biden, but because they're motivated by Trump. Um, and in those swing states, mine is one of those, like, let's just say five states, that suburban voter still probably won't vote for Trump. The question is, will they vote for Biden like they did in 2020, or will they just do some third party you know, thing or a write-in or something like that? That's the question that I don't know. Answer. Do you talk with Governor Haley? Do yeah, you... yeah, not okay. often, but you know, we've known each other for years. Okay. Well, what would you advise her to do? Um, you know, once South Carolina is over, she's talking about staying in at least through Super Tuesday. Um, is that is that it? Do you think at that point she should bow out? I'm not going to give her that kind of advice. I, I think it's healthy for a party that she's in. Uh, I think she's rating. I actually watched her speech. I'm I usually too busy, but I made a point of watching. Um, I watched the tape version you know, the, of her speech yesterday. I thought it was a very well written, very well delivered speech. I thought it was spot on. Um, the problem is he has Trump has just a really good grip on a big base of our primary. But if you look at numbers and polls, most people don't want either of these two guys for our candidates. You know, about half of the Republicans don't want Trump as their nominee. So I do think she's bringing up a healthy dialogue, raising important questions. So I think it's healthy for our party that she stays in the race. How long she should stay in, I, I'll just leave it to her to make that decision. Okay. Uh, we have some audience. We, we sort of crowdsourced some questions from the audience ahead of time. Um, Glenn Harden from Kansas asks, what will it take to break Trump's stronghold uh, on the Republican Party? And, and by that, I think looking forward five years, 10 years, is this, yeah. is this a, you called it a cult of personality. Is it a cult of personality that applies just to him? Or in five to 10 years, has the fever broke? But we've kind of been asking that for almost five, seven years already. Yeah, I give a lot of thought to this question. Um, I think so. Uh, my best stab at this, at, at an answer is, it really is kind of a cult personality around he himself, this one man. People who try to copy him don't fare nearly as well. And the other point is, there's really, this is kind of pablum. It's, it's, you can't build a majoritarian national party on a personality. And the zero sum game politics that gets played with this uh, means there are no positive sum games, no win win situations. Either it's a winner and a loser. And that typically involves a primary these days. And so, what I think the answer to his question is, is he has pushed more people through primaries that lose general elections. So, I think, A, this is his last election. I mean, he's, he's old. And, and if he wins, it's clearly his last election because he can't run again. If he loses, I think just age will, will, will displace him. That'd be my guess. And I think we're going to – more losses that pile up. When we produce more MAGA general election you know, candidates, we lose more things. So continuing to lose because we're not offering a positive vision built with policies built on enduring principles, which is what you do to build a majority party, and not having that and losing because of this cult of personality wrapped around this one person – and the zero sum political games that get played with it and the and the general election candidates that are produced out of this sort of dynamic that continue to lose will force us into a soul searching of a party. And that soul searching of a party will probably produce some melding, some fusion of, you know, what worked with Trumpism, you know, some some sort of, you know, nationalist um, America first, you know, po populism along with traditional republicanism classical liberal republicanism that produces some kind of a fusion party i was involved in these early fights back in the early 90s as a staffer when it was sort of my boss jack kemp against pat buchanan you know it was the paleocons against the neocons and all of that usually gets settled out when you have a new nominee representing a strain of this part of our party that wins the presidency and then settles this debate and so that's the process we'll go through, but regrettably, it will probably be after we string up some more losses and we prove that this populism, which is not tethered to any principle, but to a person's personality, is just not strong enough, durable enough to build a majoritarian party. When we finally realize that after stringing some losses, then we will have a soul searching, which gives us this kind of fusion that hopefully out of that builds a majoritarian party. Because the center right in this country really is where the country is, in my opinion. And I think that's where the best answers to our problems lie. And we've got the problem with this moment, this very politically unserious moment we're in, 
is the problems that are facing this country are all within our power to solve them. And if we solve our problems, we can have a phenomenal century. We can have a phenomenal century where we can get back to the days of our kids being better off than we are, where we solve our problems in this generation and we have a, a peaceful, safe country with upward mobility, we're getting at poverty, and people believe in America, people love America, people are doing better in this country from all walks of life. I think that's totally attainable, it's gettable, but we gotta put the right policies in place, and right now we're not even having that kind of debate, frankly. Okay, there's one place where problems are not really being solved right now. Yeah, they're old... Congress on Yes. Your old stomping grounds, the House of Representatives, has really just devolved into a, I don't know, a parliamentary system in which there's no real majority coalition. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll start with a question, another question from the audience. Uh, Brendan Mahoney from Massachusetts asks, this is one you're not going to want to answer. If you were Speaker of the House today, what would you be doing differently than Speaker Johnson? Look, uh, Boehner didn't do it to me. I didn't do it to McCarthy. I don't want to do it to, to Mike Johnson. Um, so I don't want to get into nit, nitpicking. I'd only say the advice I gave, I've given to people in this job, advice I've been given. Um, Boehner used to always say, a man, you know, a leader without followers is just a guy taking a walk. Um, I don't think you can be good at these jobs unless you're willing to lose them. And that's, you have to get your mind at a stage in your life and career where when the, the, the best move to make um, could put yourself in jeopardy to losing your job, but it's the best move to make, that's where, where you really truly be good at these things. Um, Mike's new, um, he, he's a fairly new guy in Congress. I like Mike a lot, I think he's a principled, good, smart guy, um, but he's got a lot of lessons he's gonna end up learning. And he's got a razor thin majority that like you say, it, it basically makes the place work like a parliamentary system. Um, I think there'll come a time a moment where he'll be faced with a decision to make. And that decision will be better made if he's just not thinking about his own personal fate. And and, and it's hard for anybody in Congress to, to, to make a decision like that. But once you get to that comfort level, I kind of got to that. I did two terms as speaker. I'd already been, I was in my ninth term when I became speaker. So I was sort of at a phase in life where I'm like, look, I don't have to keep this job. I didn't ask for it in the first place. I'm just going to kind of go where I think we need to go, do what I think I need to do. And if, and, if, and if I leave, I leave. And, and once I made that, that switch in my mind, I was far better at this job. And I was able to just see the situation more clearly, more calmly, and make better play calls. Um, getting my, my mindset there, to me, is what was the critical point for me to be effective. Um, the last term as speaker was one of the most productive sessions we've had in, in, our, in, in a generation. Um, we passed 1,172 bills that session, which is, you know, far more than you usually produce. And about, more than half of those, I think, made into law. So it was a very, very productive session. And the, the point, the last point I'd say is, but that's because we were, even with Trump in his first two years, we were leading the conference on policy. Our party was defined by, by principles and policies, and it was a policy-leading conference. So we could, we could define success with a policy outcome that we wanted to, which were based upon the principles that we ran on and professed. This Do day and age is different. It is a politically led conference. So this conference and this party and this conference by extension is led by politics. And politics is, is dominated by elections. And elections are literally zero sum games. Your primary, your general election, there's a winner and there's a loser and there are zero sum games, and there's no positive sum outcomes. There's no Venn diagram where you have win-win situations. So if you are in the party mindset that this is a zero sum game, then legislating where you have positive sum outcomes where you can negotiate and compromise and, and see a policy outcome that can be advanced where both sides can win, that's the kind of dynamic we had in the old days, like you know, six years ago, that is not the dynamic they're in right now. They're in a political dynamic where it's zero-sum game thinking, zero-sum game politics. And well, that is very, very that? ugly. And that's the situation Mike's finding himself in, I think. Is, is that a fault of the, the, the top leaders for not getting people focused better on this? Um, 
you know, is a is the problem that started in under McCarthy and has just grown worse in recent weeks. You've got a national security supplemental um, still, you know, now sitting in the House that nobody quite knows what's going to happen to it. You know, Russia is out there. They've they've got two, uh, you know, just the Navalny murder and then the one in Spain the other day. Um, you know, where do they have to take this? to start getting actual policy outcomes. If the animating principle of your party revolves around the personality of a man and not the substance of principles and policies, this is the kind of outcome you're going to get. Okay, well, how often do you talk to members still? And All the and, time. Okay. All the time. You know, I, it's just, I, of, I still have a lot of fun. About half the people in the college conference are probably new since I left. Um, about half are there. So I still have a lot of good, deep friendships. Okay. And I talk to members all the time. You know, there's, a, there's been a bunch of retirement announcements in recent weeks. But one in particular jumped out to me. And I'm sure it jumped out to you, your fellow Wisconsin Republican, Mike Gallagher. Uh, I believe he got elected in, I think, 2016. Uh, right to replace Reed Ribble. Um, yeah, I recruited him. You recruited him. Okay, mm -hmm. young guy, um, patriotic as heck. Served tours with the Marines. Um, comes to Congress. He, we after just three terms, they created a special committee to look at China and sort of the competition with China in the 21st century, and they made him chair of this committee. It's been hailed by many as doing some good bipartisan work. Uh, yeah. I believe Mr. Gallagher is still only 39. I don't think he's hit 40 yet. And he just announced that he's retiring. Was that a gut punch for you? I mean, he is part of the, yeah. he's the part of the Paul Ryan political family tree here. A guy who's really serious, sober, uh, thinks about his job, isn't here for performance art. And now he's leaving. I know him well. He's a good friend. Like I said, I recruited him. Uh, I, I, uh, he's the kind of person I think, you know, the founders envisioned, um, look, you're asking me why he's left. I mean, look, he's got a very young family. Uh, he wants to have more kids. Uh, I think he likes the idea of dedicating all of his time to the causes he cares about, you know, which is really pretty much national security and that, that idea. Um, I don't think public service is, is done for Mike. I think he's probably taken a hiatus given where he is in his phase of life and family. I think he's gotten a lot done. At a pretty short clip, um, I think Hakeem and Kevin, you know, Jeffries and McCarthy deserve a lot of credit for forming this committee and putting two really good members, Raj Krishnamurthy and 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 Mike, on top of this committee. It's like the one really positive thing I've seen come out of this this political era we are in, which is these two serious legislators have sort of basically built the framework for a bipartisan, durable China consensus policy. So I think Mike and, and, and Raj, his, his partner, deserve a ton of credit for this. And so I think Mike sort of feels like he put things on a good track with respect to that. And he's just basically making a family decision and a, and a, and a career decision. You know, I'll let his, I, I, I didn't read his announcement. I'll let it speak for itself. But, um, you know, I think Kathy just retired. She's still got a term left, if I'm not mistaken, in her tenure. She Mark Green, I, just, yeah. Just, yeah, I think he just got his, his chairmanship. So I think you're seeing, you know, some leaders leave. A lot of my really close friends like like Mac Thornberry and Jeff Hensley are gone. Um, there is a, a dynamic I'm worried about, which is the policymakers, the people who go there who are animated by policy outcomes and principles are leaving. And what regrettably is oftentimes replacing them are entertainers, people who measure their success in Congress by hits and clicks and entertainment value, who can get famous and then probably rich later because they're performers. There's more and more of that, and that is just what, what, what our modern society is dealing with these days. So, yes, I see Mike's retirement as a punctuation mark on this, this dynamic that I, that I don't like seeing. Good people leaving um, and different people following them, and I hope, I hope we get a good candidate there. There's a lot of good people. I, I know the area really, really well, um, but I do worry about that dynamic. Uh, and, and, you know, I think my worry is the kind of people that are being attracted to run for Congress these days are not exactly the kind of people who are going to solve a lot of our problems. But again, I'm an anti-establishment Republican, and the establishment right now is Donald Trump and his cult of personality. And that right. is regret 
that what is attracting what is what is really sort of the core of our party at this moment. I think it's temporary because I just frankly can't see it being sustainable. Uh, and to the Kinsons question that you had earlier, we'll get through it. But right now, it's it's just kind of where we are. OK, when we did this at the very end of your speakership in late 2018, you admitted there was only one political job left for you, and that is ambassador to Ireland. Ireland. Does that still stand? my fifties, so yeah. Does that still stand? Do you have any interest somewhere down the line? You're only fifty-three. You know, well, I just turned fifty-four a couple weeks ago. But um, oh, uh, I don't, my bad. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know. I don't. Right now, obviously, I wouldn't do well if I wanted to run in Republican policies right now because I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a Trump guy. So uh, I, I really enjoy my life right now, but I am deeply worried about the country. That's why I spend a lot of my time on public policy matters. Um, you never say never. I'm young enough that I have a third career. I'm in my second career right now. Who knows? I don't know. But it's not really top of mind right now, frankly. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We're all going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of the viewers for joining us. Um, remember, please go to WashingtonPost.com. You can read more about all of these different topics. Please subscribe. It's, uh, it's a great news organization. We'd like to have more of you here. Bye now.